Hello everyone. Now before I start this video, I want to urge you guys to uh, go subscribe to some new MGTOW talent. I mean, relatively new. I'm sure many of you already know of him, but uh, Turd Flinging Monkey has graciously decided to uh, write for my uh, website, sheddingoftheego.com. And uh, he's written some excellent articles and uh, some of my, some of my uh, most commented on articles are written by him. Uh, and I'm going to include those in the description box as well as my favorite video from Turd Flinging Monkey. So um, if you guys uh, want some new uh, MGTOW talent, I think he's one of the very best of, I guess you could call it the new blood of MGTOW. Um, you know, very, very good videos. And I do uh, like his channel very much, and it's been a long time coming. I was actually planning on doing this, but now, uh, especially since, you know, he decided to write for my uh, website, it's the least that I can do in, uh, in order to uh, repay him uh, and maybe uh, get some subs uh, going over there to his channel, which I think he deserves. So, uh, gentlemen, please subscribe to his channel. And again, the link is going to be in the description box. I'm going to start this video off by reading to you a quote. The quote is as follows. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete." End quote. Such were the words uttered by the brilliant R. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, that is the American architect whose uh, famous uh, geodesic domes would inspire the naming of the buckyball fullerene molecule. And I believe this was the architect who constructed that famous uh, Disney World sculpture, the geodesic dome. But given his words, I think that the question becomes immediately apparent to a MGTOW or even a men's rights activist as to the effective way to combat anti-male bias and misandry. The question is, how do we make misandry obsolete? And is this even possible? Can we do this? And if so, where do we start? Well, I don't pretend to have a suitable answer to that question, at least not a conclusive one, but I think that the question, properly rephrased, is more accurately posed as this. How do we stop a sexually dimorphic species, in which the female of the species is imbued with inherent value, reproductively speaking, from structuring its society in ways that lend themselves to the exploitation of men? I would argue that while it is impossible to eliminate gynocentrism, we can instead implement checks and balances on it by making the most egregious examples of gynocentrism, or should I say the occurrence of them, obsolete. Now, in a little bit, I'm going to pose to you a legal and moral conundrum, and then I'm going to ask that you draw a logical conclusion surrounding that conundrum. But for now, uh, I'm just going to start instead by relegating to you the untimely demise of a man named Mike McQueen. I can't do that without first telling you the current situation facing a man named Gary Smith. Gary Smith is a 33-year-old former U.S. Army veteran who served two tours in Afghanistan, and Smith was, in September of 2006, roommates with the now-deceased McQueen. This all changed when McQueen was found dead in their shared apartment from a fatal gunshot wound. Uh, the cause of death was, at first, deemed an apparent suicide. McQueen's longtime girlfriend had dumped him, and a recent drunk driving conviction made his chances for employment seem stark. We all know that when the human male's favorite plumage, right, that is his utility, isn't shining as bright as he thinks it should be, uh, men tend to kill themselves in large numbers. So it certainly wasn't outside of the realm of possibility that McQueen killed himself. Uh, but as other details uh, began to emerge, including the fact that the owner of the gun McQueen was killed or took his own life with, uh, was Gary Smith, as well as Smith's account of the night's events to police changing on three different occasions, Smith was then charged with McQueen's murder. Now, in the two separate trials that followed, uh, Smith was then convicted of second-degree murder, and both of these trials have since been overturned on appeal, paving the way uh, for Smith's upcoming third trial. Now, uh, both of Smith's trials have produced, at this point, very little hard evidence to suggest his guilt or innocence, making his uh, convictions largely circumstantial. But this may not be the case, uh, however, in his upcoming third trial, depending on certain factors. Now, advances in the science of fMRI imaging have allowed us to interview people like McQueen under the scrutiny of real-time neural fMRI feedback. And a gentleman by the name of Joel, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Joel Huizenga, 
who was the CEO of a company called Truthful Brain, had this to say about uh, Smith's case. He says, quote, deliberately lying is hard work. When you're telling the truth, you're just retrieving a memory. But when you lie, you have to bring back the truth first and then manipulate it. And doing that requires much more of the brain to be active. This means blood rushes to specific areas which are never really used when you are being truthful. And the fMRI allows us to detect these relative changes of blood flow. The article then says of Huizenga, it says, Huizenga initially asked Smith to intentionally lie in response to simple questions about his age and place of birth to get an idea of what his brain looks like when he's lying. Then he compared those scans to the ones taken while he questioned about McQueen. And then Huizenga says, quote, again, in my opinion, they show beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is innocent. Everything about the scans is completely clean, Huizenga says. None of the brain areas associated with lying light up whatsoever when he's asked about killing his roommate, end quote. And then the article continues by saying, But these scans will not be shown to the jury when Smith is tried again later this year. Last month, however, his attorney requested a new Fry hearing, a proceeding which determines whether new technology can be used as evidence in a court of law, but the request was denied. Now, you don't have to warn me about the potential dangers that allowing what sounds a little too much like a slightly more credible neural polygraph on steroids as admissible evidence in a court of law could bring. Uh, the fact that no single human being's brain physiology is identical to any other human raises the possibility of every individual having a slightly different set of neural pathways lighting up under fMRI analysis during the act of lying. But, but... Uh, this does not conclusively rule out the possibility of some kind of fMRI uh, dishonesty fingerprint uh, becoming discernible in the future for each individual, according to their unique neurology. We do, in fact, know that subjects seem to interpret things like acronyms, such as DVD and CIA, in ways that are, in fact, unique to the individual, uh, unique enough for scientists to identify those individuals by electroencephalogram analysis, of those individuals' unique brain patterns, you know, scientists are discovering new forms of biometrics on a daily basis, right? The wobble of your walk when you wear a body camera is as unique as a fingerprint. And there's no reason why, you know, neurology, neural physiology won't have this same kind of pattern uh, unique to individuals as well. So then we arrive at the conundrum that I hinted at earlier. The question is, how would this technology assuming it passes this Fry standard, affect the frequency and potency of the false rape accusation. Uh, the feminist outrage would be severe and instantaneous if it ever became possible to unilaterally dismiss a false rape accusation, or a, I'm sorry, a rape accusation based off of this fMRI test alone. But this is not the likely scenario that would unfold if this technology became admissible as evidence in court. What is more likely to happen is the following hypothetical scenario. A woman accuses a man of rape falsely. The man is then arrested. During trial, the accusing woman must at the very least attempt to state a time and a place where the rape allegedly happened. So fMRI analysis can then be conducted and the woman can be asked whether or not she was in fact at the scene of the crime, as well as places where it can be conclusively determined that she was not at the time of the alleged rape. From the places where it can be conclusively determined that she was not present, a truth profile of sorts can be ascertained by correlating her neurological patterns with her admission that she was not at these places. None of this should be considered exculpatory evidence or even evidence to suggest that the alleged rapist is innocent, but it sets the stage for the following. The truth profile is then compared to her neurological profile when asked if she was at the scene of the crime and was in fact raped by the man she was accusing. And then questions are posed designed to point investigators toward exculpatory evidence that can potentially be discovered at the actual scene of the crime. Now, a practical example of this is the following. A woman says a man raped her. The man claims he's innocent. The man is arrested and claims that the sex was consensual and that video evidence exists that can prove it. But he believes that the recording may have been hidden or even deleted by the accusing woman, or he believes that the video is in imminent danger of being deleted by the woman, if she can find it and get her hands on it. And let's assume that the woman doesn't know where it is, but it's in several key locations that both of these individuals frequent. 
The fMRI test can then be used not to determine whether or not the woman is lying about hiding or deleting the video evidence, but instead for establishing a timeline as to where this woman was on the day investigators believe she may have hidden or deleted the video, and thus a series of questions could follow. Questions such as, where were you on the date of the 27th between the hours of etc.? Uh, were you at the library, or at the grocery store, or in your apartment? Right? And this, juxtaposed with the fMRI truth signature, can give an average likelihood of where she actually was versus where she says she was, if she's being dishonest and leading investigators on a wild goose chase in order to preserve evidence that she will later contaminate. Without the fMRI scan, investigators would have to randomly choose a destination to begin examining for evidence based solely off of the potentially biased locations she claimed she was, potentially hampering the time it takes to recover this evidence. So armed with this truth profile, investigators could pick selectively where they investigate first according to what the profile suggests, in potential contradiction to her testimony, leading to potentially time-sensitive or perishable evidence faster. So this, in my opinion, allows this technology to be employed in the process of helping to suggest guilt or innocence without the disturbing possibility that it could one day hold the same sort of clout that DNA does in our justice system today. So uh, with that said, gentlemen, put your pitchforks and torches away. There is no minority report dystopia heading our way. I just, I'm just exploring this technology and the possible ramifications of it. But, you know, speaking of minority report, I think that the fictional world of minority report highlights the exact dilemma that I've just described. Uh, now, if you pardon my foray into fictional worlds here, I'm going to refresh your memory if you've already watched this film. And in, and in the plot of Minority Report, we see that through the magic of science fiction, three mutated humans called precogs have in what appears to be extremely controlled conditions designed to potentiate their natural talents. They have achieved the ability of prescience to such a degree that an entire legal system has been centered around their abilities. Pre-criminals, uh, that is the name given to people who are convicted according to the precogs and their prescient algorithms of crimes they intended to commit but never actually did due to the intervention of law enforcement, these pre-criminals are imprisoned all on the account of the precogs accusing them of this bastardized dystopian version of charges such as attempted murder. And they're imprisoned in stasis chambers where they are housed in a catatonic state for the duration of their sentence. Now, these precogs were eventually decommissioned, uh, being set free to live out their lives as normal human beings, and all convicted pre-criminals are eventually set free when, for the first time ever, a pre-criminal definitively proves that the predictions of the three precogs were wrong, at least in one instance. Ignoring the ethical ramifications uh, involved with using live human beings as, you know, unconscious uh, crime predictors, after watching that movie, uh, and ever since, I've often wondered why the precogs were totally decommissioned. Could their abilities not have been used to continue to stop crime, like, 99% of the time? Even if this single instance of precog fallibility meant that it is no longer acceptable to imprison people off of the concept of pre-crime? Could the precogs not be used in locating evidence? Fingerprints where the precog envisioned a suspect touching? Search parties where the precogs envisioned a killer dumping a body? An entire field of probabilistic forensics could have emerged by continuing to employ the abilities of the precogs after the fall of pre-crime. Couldn't it have? And those are the interesting questions, right? The, the plot holes that are left unanswered in this, in this movie. Uh, and that's the beauty of science fiction, is that it allows us to foresee our reaction to certain technologies before they arrive. Gattaca did this with genetic engineering, right? Designer babies and all that stuff. And uh, it allows us also uh, to foresee our reactions to technologies when they arrive first in slightly more primitive forms than are depicted in the uh, fictional setting. So if we speculate as to what the essential nature of pre-crime was in, this, uh, in the fictional Minority Report universe, we could come to a conclusion that what the precogs were actually doing was taking our understanding of essential human nature, 
weighing behavior algorithms for each individual citizen in the Minority Report universe, uh, given to them by what I could only assume was a robust big data industry, which, you know, we already have in real life, by the way. And then comparing that to the billions and billions of possible variables that could influence human behavior to arrive at a deterministic predictive model for the citizen in question. Now, my reason for this speculation surrounding the mechanisms of the precogs is not to bore you or to rant off topic for large portions of this video, but it is instead designed to revoke its almost supernatural qualities to remove it from the grasp of magic or transhuman mysticism and to place it instead back firmly in the clutches of the potential capabilities of science where it belongs. The precogs may seem otherworldly to us, right? They might seem like preternatural manifestations of a deterministic abyss we can hardly grasp, but the truth is that a sufficiently powerful quantum computer capable of, for example, modeling the trillions of molecular interactions following the milliseconds after the Big Bang, a computer like this could likely perform the function of the precogs effectively. But for now, for now, uh, the concept of pre-crime remains comfortably out of our grasp, and instead of looking to the future to prevent crime, we instead have developed fMRI technology that allows us to peer into a potential suspect's neurological interpretations of the crime after it has happened. So my question is, what will feminists and the women they claim to represent have to say about all this as we move into the future? Now, as we know, feminists have been known to resist technologies that would retard their victim status narrative, even at times at the expense of the ability of the women they claim to advocate for to avoid being victimized. Uh, we're probably all familiar with that uh, 2014 controversy surrounding the development of a nail polish that was uh, chemically designed to detect the presence of uh, date rape drugs and rehypnol and all that stuff. And uh, uh, the article that I, I'm, I'm putting in this description box gives the uh, ever dysfunctional feminist perspective in this case. It says, quote, I think that anything, this is a feminist responding uh, to the rape uh, date rape drug detecting nail polish. She says, quote, I think that anything that can help reduce sexual violence from happening is, in some ways, a really good thing. Tracy Vitchers, the board chair for Students Active for Ending Rape, uh, the acronym is SAFER, how cute, uh, told Think Progress. But I think we need to think critically about why we keep placing the responsibility for preventing sexual assault on young women, end quote. Now, this may seem like generic feminist stupidity.